that the molecule is irreducibly complex. And what he says is, picture an outdoor motor on a boat. And uh, that thing is going to run. It's going to move your boat. It's going to cause the propeller to go so you can take off. But every component of that motor is 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 reliant on the the functioning of the other part of that mm-hmm. motor so that if you take one piece of it away, the motor's not going to work. Mm-hmm. He, in discovering the molecule, says that's how the molecule works. So there could not have been an evolution to bring forth the molecule because there's already an irid. You can't make it less complex than it is as you see it now. Mm-hmm. So some kind of intelligence had to made that happen, just like some type of intelligence builds an outdoor motor. Mm-hmm. Welcome back to On the Line. In today's episode, we're going to sit down with my father, David Stecker, who's also a pastor of 26 years. And primarily, we're going to be talking about uh, how atheists often debate with Christians and how Christianity and science can relate. Uh, This is something that he's had a big interest in over the years. He's lectured on this. He's debated with atheists. So this is kind of right in his wheelhouse. Also, he's got a big interest in scotch. So if you have an interest in scotch of learning some more about understanding his Mount Rushmore of the scotches that he really appreciates, We will get into that at the very end of the episode, so uh, stay tuned for that. Also, if you can do two things for us, first off, simply clicking the like button, it takes three seconds, very much helps with the YouTube algorithms, and second, um, if you uh, listen on a podcast platform, if you take the time to give us a review, five stars, of course, is our preference, that also helps get the message of this podcast out to more and more people. So thank you for your continued support, and enjoy. Right. And Bennett says we're live, so we're good to go. All righty. All right. So David Stecker. Yes. And the name sounds familiar because you are, in fact, my father, but not just my father. You are also a pastor and you've been a pastor for how long? 26 years now. 26 years. Yeah. Okay. So we've, uh, uh, you're here for my daughter, our third daughter was just baptized. Right. On St. Patrick's Day. That's right. Which was really cool. Uh We almost dressed her in green, but we stuck with the traditional white for the baptism. Right. Um, so you're here, and this was a great opportunity to talk with you about a couple of things. The biggest thing we're going to get into, and I want you to kind of introduce you a little bit first, but the biggest thing is you have uh, had kind of been in the crosshairs and spent a lot of time wrestling with what atheists teach, mm-hmm. right? the way that they think, the way that they critique Christianity, particularly in the realm of science and religion, and you'll kind of hash out some of those terminologies. So that's mm-hmm. that'll be kind of our full uh, that's where we'll, we'll really get into it is is on that topic. But uh, a couple other things that I think are interesting. One, can you just uh, tell our audience a little bit about where you've been at Emmanuel in New Haven and you've kind of had an interesting ministry construction there? Yeah, it's a rare one. Uh, I was called right from the SEM at Fort Wayne, Concordia, and uh, that was 26 years ago, and I'm in the same place. It's kind of interesting. Your mother traveled around a lot. In the old, mm-hmm. in the days with her father, and she always wanted to have a house and live in the same house for more than two years, and she's been in the house now for twenty six years because mm-hmm. we got the call to Emmanuel Lutheran Church, and I was one of three pastors, and uh, that was for twenty three years. The three of us have been together twenty two, twenty three years, and now Pastor Shoemaker, our senior pastor, uh, he, he retired. Mm-hmm. And now it's down to the two of us. But so Pastor Zexer and myself, we've been together now for 26 years. And he's been there 28 years. Okay. And we we looked and checked the synod and couldn't find anybody or any other church that had three pastors that long. Yeah. Together. So that might be a record is what you're saying. It might be a record. Three pastors in yes. 23 years. Yes. And no if Scott and I go together for another, how many other years? I'm wondering how long. that we, we, We're probably going to break a record yeah. if we don't have it already. Yeah. yeah. What kind of benefits did you notice with the longevity? So I'm on my second call. I'm mm-hmm. six years into ministry, yeah. so a little six bit different. Six years, on two calls. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> accept what, accepted ones and non-accepted ones. So mm-hmm. I've never experienced that in 26 years, which is kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. Um. I I think it, a lot of it has to do, and if we might talk about it later, if we have time, and that has to do with the outreach to uh, Point of Grace, Kenya. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did something from the very beginning 
uh, with mission tri trips out there. And had I not, had I left at any time from Emmanuel, we wouldn't be where we are right now with that outreach. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a big part of it. Uh, because you have to be kind of the cornerstone of the endeavor because you're the one that you, your, your eyes are on it. It's part of your job. You're mm -hmm. integrated. You know all of the elements. And people come and go, and they help in, in essential ways. But mm -hmm. the fact that you were there for so long, you're saying that's that's helped that mission grow and reach its potential. Right, because we developed something early on. Myself and a uh, member of our congregation, Shirley Dietz, mm -hmm. right from the beginning. And we had our first mission trip. It started off in Jamaica in 2000, 2001. But we, the two of us developed a mission plan mm -hmm. because – we didn't want to have an outreach where it was more more like a glorified vacation or something like that, but just to get involved with uh, a particular mission and really do good, do something with them and, and build a relationship. So over the years, we've actually developed a whole plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, and maybe we could talk about it if you wanted to mm -hmm. later, we uh, uh, are sharing that with other churches as well. Yeah. Yeah. And we, yeah, we'll definitely circle back. And what we'll also do for those that are you know watching now, they're interested in that, but maybe they don't make it all the way to the end of the video is we'll also clip that as well and put it out there. Cause that's, I think yeah. the model that you guys have is very interesting. Right. And I think you've got some good insights, even just from a macro standpoint from the synod, you know, on, on how to do missions yeah, effectively, or at least some things for them right. for everyone to consider. Right. And I just, at, at this point think, why, why have I been there that long? And I think that's one of the major reasons I'm just reflecting on that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, though, I had a great relationship with the other guys, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not always the reason why you don't get a call somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the reason. One of the reasons I think I'm there. Yeah. And it does take time to form relationships. You know, yes. we're, we've been here now for two years. But at first, when you look out at people, it's just a bunch of faces. You know, and yeah. you know, you know, they're human, but you don't know who they are. Like, you don't have yeah. names or stories attached. And yeah. now that we're two years in, there's so many people in our church that we we know their background. We know who who they're related to, all of these things. And then they become, you know, you're able to then build those relationships and right. uh, kind of speak more pointedly on things that they are thinking or wrestling or going through. Yeah. There's a definite advantage mm -hmm. to do that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. What about scotch? <laughs> oh, my scotch. <laughs> what's, so how many, every what's your collection you come, of scotch? It's interesting. Every time you come uh, to the house, okay, Dad, let's try the scotch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm 60 years old now, and I started drinking scotch at 50. So mm -hmm. it's not like I've been doing this all my life, but I tasted scotch a little earlier than that. Maybe I mean, probably my first taste of scotch whiskey as opposed to bourbon and others mm -hmm. it was around 48 49 and I, I liked it and then i started getting involved with it and uh studying it mm -hmm. and now i can take you on a tour as you know uh if bennett ever wants to come to the house we can we can i'll give him a tour of my 12 scotches from fruity to smoky yeah and 12 not because not because you've only been exposed to 12, but because that's your that's your rule, right? That's, that's your rule. boundary. You say, yes. I keep 12. I keep 12. And if I find a scotch that I like a lot and I want to put it in the 12, I have to get rid of one of the other ones. Yeah. It's kind of the game I play. So I can't have 20 scotches, 12. Uh, good church number 12. It, there you go. That's uh, the number. But yeah. <laughs> and completion so, for scotch. Right. Exactly. So um, yeah. So it's kind of a game I play. I find one. I could try a new one. And then I'll think... Is it good? Is it worth the top 12? Mm -hmm. And if so, one has to get booted out. So what if somebody is drinking bourbon? What would you tell to them? Should, why should they switch to scotch? Um, I wouldn't say switch to scotch, but you know what? Scotch has a greater variance of taste. Mm. And your brother-in-law, Tom, Tom, he's really big in the bourbon. And when I'm at his house, he'll give me some of And I like bourbon too. But scotch, when you watch these guys develop the scotch, and you got the peated ones over there. If you go to the Isles in Scotland, you go to the Isles and they got used peat and it's a very smoky taste, the mm -hmm. kind you like. Mm -hmm. And uh, you go to the Highlands and that's more fruity and everything in between. And people are taking different casks. Like uh, one of my favorites is the Glen Morangie Quinta Reuben because mm -hmm. they age it in these uh, oak casks and at the end they'll put them in uh, is it, uh, Portuguese. Port barrels, port, yeah. yeah, and they'll give you all different types of flavors and different tastes. So mm -hmm. the comparison of tastes is, is a big reason why. And of mm -hmm. course, it's barley as opposed to corn. Okay, 
So uh, that you're starting with a different grain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it is uh, it is interesting. Every time we go and you, you take us through kind of the tour, all the details and, and whatnot, yeah. and how it reflects even the land, right? You know, our daughter's it name is does. I Lee, which I is know. Yeah. my wife's Scottish. So I La is, as mm -hmm. you said, the coastal region. So there's, yeah. it's kind of a reg uh, uh, geographical name to some degree. But with that, the Scotch represents the harshness and the saltiness of the 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 land there. So, yeah. yeah, and I can take you to some scotches there on the islas, and I'll tell you, you could taste the seaweed from the ocean. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. You could take the Anoa. Yeah, the Anoa, the uh, Ardabeg yep. Anoa. I can taste mm -hmm. it. Yes, and the, uh, the the these casts will breathe in this stuff over the years. They're sitting in there, and mm -hmm. yeah, the history of scotch is amazing. So just studying it, and just studying how these guys do it, mm -hmm. it's an art. It's these uh, masters at their crafts. They're so good at what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's kind of it's it's a, it's a nice journey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's something poetically even Christian about the the expression of you put it as kind of like it becomes an art. You know, like there's some some colleges I've been interested in, um, and they'll kind of incorporate that even into their education. These are smaller colleges, often classical in nature. Uh -huh. But there was one up in New Hampshire that we were close to. Uh, it was probably 15 minutes from us. And it was a pretty, um, Anthony Esselin, some of our listeners might know him. You know, he's a great author. And he was a professor there for many years. But as part, like they grow, I know they do like honey and syrup. And they do some different things where they want their students to kind of get involved in hands-on type artistic things. Not just like drawing or painting, but actual mm -hmm. things associated with nature. And that's certainly something that Scotch would be that, right? It's just, yeah. you're, you're, there's, there's, it's not a science, it, there's all these elements and you kind of bring them together and you create something and then you learn about it and then there's the nuances and then you explore the nuances and it becomes, it becomes a craft, which is which sure. Is cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I tried to do a, uh, I've not been successful with it yet, but sometimes I take what, what you call a single malt. That's what I like the most. And mm -hmm. there's blended ones. I try to blend something together and see what it would taste like and do my own blending as if I'm some kind of expert. And I haven't done too well with that, yeah. <laughs> but these guys know how to do it. Yeah. You know, like you, we we talked about the black label, and that's mm -hmm. got I think twenty five different whiskeys that are in there blended together. Not all barley, but some other grain too, but mostly barley. And mm -hmm. They come up with these wonderful tastes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Bennett, are you sold? Scotch gonna? All right. <laughs> <Bennett's>... <laughs> all right. Yeah. So th that's interesting. But let's let's dive in a little bit to kind of your passion and probably what most people have, have plugged into here, but I think it's kind of fun to hear what people are passionate about. So um, you got very much kind of entrenched in and, and focused on over the course of your 26 years of ministry. There was a long period there where if you were to ask most people what's Pastor Stecker's shtick, it would have been you were very fascinated with and did a lot of research into kind of the debates that were happening um, between atheism and Christianity a lot of that manifested mm -hmm. into the sciences, but what what got you interested into that topic? Yeah, uh, well, for me, having a conversation with somebody I disagree with is more fun than having a conversation with somebody I agree with. Although, mm -hmm. you know, I need to do both because if I'm interested in something, I like to find somebody who knows more about it than I do, and then learn from them. Mm -hmm. you know, and if we're both of the same belief or, or thought. But the idea of uh, talking with people that disagree, I disagree with that. I, I just, I'm intrigued by that. And then the ultimate thing would be as a Christian, uh, what's going on in the atheist mind? Why would he or she look at this world and suggest that there is no God? And that, that's kind of the ultimate. You know, if I'm going to sit here and I'm going to talk to somebody about the meaning of life or what is reality, uh, Take an atheist, and why? Do you, why are you an atheist? And so, uh, Facebook you know, is something for a lot of different people. For me, it was when I first got involved with Facebook, and it wasn't about necessarily pictures of the family and uh, getting together with friends of, of of my past, which I've done. Mm -hmm. But I got into groups where uh, you know I'm interested in. And you go into these groups and especially like, let's say, intelligent design, we can talk about that mm -hmm. uh, in a little bit if you want, but well, we probably will end up doing that. 
but uh, you go on these groups and you got these atheists who love being on those groups and challenging us mm -hmm. in regards to our beliefs. And they come in and they hit hard. And I was gravitated to that because I wanted to come in and hit hard back, sometimes for the wrong reason, mm -hmm. you know. And so I started a lot of dialogues with atheists through those kinds of networks through Facebook mm -hmm. to the point where uh, I think I had to have an intervention by their family. I remember. <laughs> I do remember uh, this. We, yeah. were, we had these I, uh, because I would have said something to, to, to one guy and he's saying something back to me and I'm trying to formulate my next point with this debate. And I'm sitting at the kitchen table and you're all like, Dad, where are you? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And uh and I, my mind was on what my next step would be, what my next point would be. And I don't do that anymore, by the way. Yeah, but there was a period of time where I did that. And I did it heavy, and I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. I probably overdid it, but I did learn a lot. And so that's the ultimate. You know, you got somebody who says there is no God, and we got here randomly, as avoid, as opposed to no, there is actually a mind, a God. There is a reality called God, and we are created for a purpose. Mm -hmm. They say, no, we're not. There's no creator, so there's no purpose. We say, no, there's a creator and there's purpose. And the atheist is going to end up, if he's honest, to be a nihilist in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, because if there is no purpose in life and we're, this is a random thing that has happened, well, then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Mm -hmm. And we say, no. I was, I was, you know, and as a Christian, uh, I know that God has always, in all eternity, wanted you and me to be created and wants to have relationship with us, mm -hmm. and has done through, done so for us through Christ. You can't get more opposing views. Yeah. What, so, what do you think? Kind of two level. One question, kind of two levels. So, at least from a pastor standpoint, do you think that this is something? I don't want to have to say it, make you say essential, but for lack of a better term, is this something essential for pastors to go through? And I'm not saying it has to be specifically about atheism, but this picture you're painting of, of wrestling with people who are very thoughtful and articulate who do not believe what you believe and going through the process of, of that fire and that sharpening period. I think so. And I'm one who's a, who's a proponent for uh, apologetics. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do so even in Lutheran Church. I know there's some disagreements with that and how far we should go with it, but... Uh, well, just take, for instance, uh, the point that they make, the point that they will make, the atheist is, and the one that's been adopted is, uh, they have science, we have faith. They mm -hmm. have reason, we have faith. And they've been able to manipulate the conversation to where when everybody asks about atheism versus Christianity, you'll notice we start with that. Mm -hmm. uh, they have science, facts, reason, we believe in something the same way as a child believes in Santa Claus. And to your point there, I've heard that before. Um, we were kind of talking about this a little bit with uh, uh, Christian Anderson a little bit, um, in that I have very much heard it taught that you just kind of have to put your head in the sand. Right. And I'm not, I'm not going to say that, that a pastor would specifically say that, but they will paint that picture mm -hmm. to where it's you just have to believe. Mm -hmm. Right. And if, and, when you teach that kind of teaching to, let's say, an eighth grader, right, who starts right. questioning the stuff, I teach seventh grade here, they're, they're asking these questions. And if you paint that picture, the eighth grader might say, okay, and they might be fine with that. And like, okay, mm -hmm. I just I just have, really have to believe. And then they're going to sit there and they're going to hear from you as a pastor for the next three, four years. And then they become a senior in high school. And then they go off to as a freshman in college. And eventually that answer you, you've given them, it might have worked at the, you might feel good, like, oh, look, you know, they're buying that and that you're going to fail them in the end because in the end they're, they're going to have to be thinking individuals because God has created them as thinking individuals. Mm -hmm. And if your best, this, if your best answer for this is put your head in the sand or you just have to have some kind of blind belief, I know you, that's a term you push back against. Yeah. What you're doing is you're preparing them for a disaster yeah. later on, which is why if you're going to be a teacher and educator and pastor, to your point, you need to be able to wrestle with these things. So you don't give bad answers and prepare them for trouble. Mm -hmm. That kid will be eaten alive, and I would suggest even in my own past, when I was uh, in my late teens, I was I went in that route too because um, why should I believe in something blindly, mm -hmm. right? You end up uh, getting to an age where you don't believe in Santa Claus anymore because you realize reindeers don't fly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, if, if that's the idea we do with Christianity, you, you, you don't believe in Christ anymore because people don't get raised from the dead. 
Well, mm -hmm. and it's not a blind faith that we have. So, no. Uh, in fact, that's what I, I do with the kids. All right, when 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 I'm teaching confirmation, mm -hmm. I will ask them. You guys have a blind faith? Yeah, we have a blind faith. No, you don't. I hope not, because uh, if you just believe in something blindly, that's the reason why your parents told you if a stranger comes up to your house and mm -hmm. says, I got a candy bar, will you come into my car? You don't do it because you don't blindly believe that the guy has your best interest. Mm -hmm. We as Christians do not have to in any way believe that way in regard to our Christian faith. Mm -hmm. We have so much that backs our faith, and it's called the Scriptures. And the Scriptures say something, and they, it's it claims itself to be the, the Word of God, and then it proves it. That's the beauty of it. Mm. The scriptures claim to be the word of God and then proves it through its prophetic pointing to Christ, Old and New Testament. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how we have to do it. We, the, the, that. That kid goes to college. He's going to have to have some way to defend his faith. And we have all kinds of reasons to defend our faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we don't believe in a blind faith. Yeah. I would hope not. So when you're, is that a good starting point? So for us as we're kind of hearing... Maybe, maybe so. What what is what's the main thrust that the atheist is making against Christianity? How, how would you define that? And yeah, maybe we can kind of walk through. Well, again, they they set up and it, it just, just go and go on and check out videos. How many times do you hear uh, faith versus science? Faith, faith versus science. Faith mm -hmm. versus science. Uh, the reality it's faith versus faith. But they have been really good. The atheists have been very good to say it's faith versus science, and therefore uh, you can believe what you want to believe based on your whatever. But we have a mechanism within science. We, we, we can take what's going on in the natural world and tell you what really is, mm -hmm. and, and you can't dispute it. Okay? So if that's true we have to define science. But every time we try to define science in any way, and I can give you examples of that, where people have tried to say, well, what is the limits of science, if any? They'll get bombarded by that group, and they won't want to, they will not want to have that discussion, mm -hmm. okay? So, for instance, if you were to take uh, a nihilistic atheist, and he's involved in create. He's a scientist, and he's creating antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And you take a young Earth creationist. He's involved in the same thing. So both of them get up in the morning, kiss their wives goodbye, and sit down and do their job. And what they're trying to do is create antibiotics to go up against these bacteria that need to be killed in people's bodies, so that um, they can help society. Both of them want to help humanity. Mm -hmm. And both of them will do the same thing. And they, when, when they do their job, that atheist and that Christian can sit next to each other and do those jobs. And they can be perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. They can be buddies because they're both doing science. They're both knowing, they know what to do, and they're working on creating an antibiotic. And if that antibiotic works, then we know the antibiotic works, right? Mm -hmm. That's science. What the... And you could do that. And you could see the control way in which you could see if it works or if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So you're saying those two individuals were able to both keep their beliefs and exercise science. So therefore, science in that realm was not actually something that, that had anything to do with their belief on how the world came to be or whether or not there's a God. Science in that realm has to deal with this controlled uh, sequence or whatever that they're working right. on. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because it's, it's, it's a study of the natural order of things. Okay. Okay. We put a guy on the moon because we, we, we get, we learn about that. You know, we learn about the cosmos. We learn about, uh, physics and so on and so forth. And we do that. We, we develop the antibiotic. We do all kinds of things. We have a microwave oven. We have computers. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a beginning and end. You can see the whole process. Uh, and that's, I guess, a belief, right? Well, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to believe that microwaves work because it heats your food. Mm -hmm. Now, what they, what the atheists will do, and the trick here is, therefore, we can now say that when we propose a theory like evolution, macroevolution, that we all came from the primordial soup, um, that's science too. Mm. 
We want to take a quick moment to give thanks and to highlight our sponsor, LCEF. That's the Lutheran Church Extension Fund. Uh, they provide loans and financial services to churches throughout the uh, Lutheran community. I've had personal experience working with them where they provide expert insights to churches on how to walk through the process of, let's say, a building project, let's say, a mission like On the Line, which LCEF jumped on very early to help support us. So they are a great resource for churches who are looking to do, let's say, building projects, let's say, mission endeavors, uh, really anything that needs financial support. If you want to find ways that you can support or learn more about LCEF, then check out the link in the description below. And when they ask the questions about origin, when they ask the questions about what happened, whether for them billions of years ago when the universe began, mm -hmm. uh, and we're not there to be able to have a controlled way in which to say, yeah, that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they'll develop, and we can get into just even the development of, of Darwinism and where that comes from. And the fact that this has been around before Jesus, mm -hmm. we can talk about that. Uh, but they bring about these theories, they bring about proposed explanations, and that's what a the theory is. And they try to tell you that they don't have any presuppositions going into their mindset. For instance, if you have um, uh, Darwin looked at you know, the, the Finches, uh, the Galapagos Islands, or whatever, we they look at those things and they say uh, there's homogeny within species. In other words, uh, a dog has two eyes and a stomach and a nose just like a human does. Mm -hmm. So does a chimp. In fact, a chimp looks a lot closer to the human too, right? And they realize that there is a homogenous relationship between animals, mm -hmm. including the human. And if you have, okay, so science says you can't invoke God, right? Because you can't prove that by science. So then there's your presupposition. How did everything get together where everything has, you know, so many different animals have two eyes and a nose and a stomach or whatever. So, they, so they're saying... You're saying that's that's data, right? That that's a fact. Right. That, we all know the homogeny exists. Yeah. yeah. But then they are looking at that information with their presupposition, and they're saying that fits into our theory that over time, all of these have a common ancestor, right? Right. Because that, yeah. it fits into their theory, but they have a so they have a presupposition. There's not a god, and we've kind of evolved over time. We've all come from one ancestor, and then over time, it, we became dogs and monkeys and humans, and you know, right. So they say that fits in, but you're saying, also from a Christian standpoint, from your presupposition, there's one god that created all of these things. Why would he not use the sim similar mechanisms? So both of you are looking at data, and that data fits into both of your theories, right? So that that data that dogs and cats and monkeys yeah. and humans have two eyes doesn't disprove one theory or the yes. other. Yes, and to their point, uh, they have to look at a naturalistic means by which we got here. Mm -hmm. So right away you're saying, all right, we're not going to invoke God here. So that's not part of our possibilities of our presupposition as to why we all have two eyes. Is, that, is that a necessity for them? Um, or Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and for good reason. Uh, you know, the, the, we shouldn't be invoking God god necessarily to create that antibiotic right mm -hmm. but they're saying okay now i have to explain why the, the the world is as it is why living species are the way they are and i can't invoke god so you've already limited to i have to find out a naturalistic way in which we got here okay and darwinism uh is the best explanation for that in other words how do i explain we're here and there's no god mm-hmm and and there's this this relationship between the human species mm -hmm. and the animal species that exist, right? There you go. But what did you just do? You have formed a presupposition as to how we got here. So if you look at the world and all of us, no matter who you are, have to recognize that there is change, say, within species. Take the dog, for instance. How many different types of dogs there are, right? Mm -hmm. Would have come from uh, one or two sets of dogs and you got all these different dogs that's fine we all agree with that yeah yeah um so the the, the scientists will say see that change happens within species and since we have to find out how we got here it's logical mm -hmm. with the presupposition 
that there is no God, which you have to start with. Mm -hmm. And for the atheist, he's motivated with that, I would suggest. Okay. And then he says, okay, well, then, then, then without invoking a God, evolution is probably all you got mm -hmm. uh, as to how we got here. So is it, so it kind of like this? Tell me if this is a right summary or a wrong summary. So, so scientific method is one way of going about trying to, trying to discover truth. Right. The scientific method is based on observation. Right. So I can't build in assumptions that I can't prove in the scientific method, strictly speaking. Yeah. Right? Is that correct? Well, yes. And what happens is from a person who is an atheist, and this is where we now get back to what, what he says is I've got science. No, he's got a philosophical premise to begin with. Mm -hmm. All right. You and I, as Christians, uh, and we, we go into the scriptures, and 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 God creates things according to their kind, all the living species according to their kind, as it says, and it was good. And therefore, you know, we we, we reject the the idea of well, not all Christians do, many don't, but we, you and I, I think, agree that uh, it's good. And uh, from those created kinds, there you go. Right, right. The, but for but for the for the atheist, so he's or not the well, just at least the person who's going through the scientific method, right? They're saying we have kind of a closed system of observation mm -hmm. and God by necessity is something you can't observe. Right. So, if, so if you have a Christian in the room and you have someone that, you know, is an atheist, let's say they can both agree that that's a fair, we would both say we can't observe. So mm -hmm. therefore for their system, they have to say, since we cannot observe God, I can't plug him into the equation because that's we're right. trying to, we're trying to present an equation that we can call, we can, hang our hat on and say, this explains reality itself. Right. So you're saying once, once you do that, which makes sense, right? It's not, it's not diabolical in that way. You know, you've got a system which doesn't have God. That system by necessity moves to something like evolution because exactly. evolution becomes the only explanation that mm -hmm. you can make where you can have a world that begins and the world that we see and, try to explain how it got here. Because for a Christian, it's, it's much easier where we can say, well, there's a God who creates, and therefore mm -hmm. if there's a God who creates, our system makes a lot of sense. But for the person going through that naturalistic approach, that person has to say, there can't be a God, so now how do we explain things? Exactly. And you're saying evolution ends up being actually the most sensible, but your, your big kind of, uh, the kicker is, how do you prove that there's not a God? Well, right. it's very well, reasonable that we there could be a God and that our system is actually correct. Is yes, yes, yeah. And it really comes down to, um, how do you want to put it? Uh, is there a limit to science? Mm -hmm. Is there? Well, uh, many would say, no, we just got to get there. All mm -hmm. right. So the, the longer we get, like, for instance, they're having a really hard time with something called abi abiogenesis, uh, which is the, how, did, how did everything start? You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they'll start with a single-celled organism that goes through the whole process of evolution uh, where there is mutation and selection and all the, all the details of that. But how did that thing start? Mm -hmm. how, how did the first living thing happen from the chemicals in that primordial soup, right? Well, they don't know, and they still don't know. They're, mm -hmm. they're miles away from it. But they'll say, one day we'll get there because there's no limit to science. You just have to get there. Mm -hmm. Okay. For you and I, uh, if you, and what's interesting is um, if you believe in God, that automatically, automatically, if you believe in God, it, it, you will come to a conclusion that there is a limit to science mm -hmm. because a belief in God is outside of science, right? And so what, what do people want to have these debates? They'll tell me uh, when they say, Provide for me the, this is the terminology they'll use, provide for me the mechanism that proves there is a God. And what they're looking for is the scientific mechanism. Mm -hmm. What's very interesting is that uh, they've already got things set up for failure in regards to a God because the scientific process is only the study of the natural order of things. Mm -hmm. And by definition, God is outside the natural order. Mm -hmm. they even have to understand that, but yet they want me to provide for them in order for them to believe in a God, the scientific mechanism that points that shows to us, there is a God like there is a uh, microwave oven. Mm -hmm. And that's impossible based on their own definition. Yeah. And based on the very definition of science, that's why they, they jump that. Mm -hmm. And when they say, 
you have faith, we have science, then they're automatically causing people to skip the real argument in regards to what are your presuppositions, what are your philosophies, mm -hmm. what is your premise to believe what you believe in regards to, say, Darwinism or whatever, and, and they got a load of it. Mm -hmm. They have a faith just like we do, okay? Mm -hmm. So they're telling me, if I, I believe in God, I have to scientifically prove it in the same way there's a microwave oven and it's been created. It's impossible for that to happen. Just so by the they, definition, yeah. definition of God. So yeah. do you think, so to your point, God by his very definition, the way that we, he's not part of creation, he's outside of creation, right? Creation exists as right. an extension of him, like it, it can't be separated from him, but we don't believe, well, Lewis put it this way, he said, you don't look for, you don't, you don't look for God in the attic. In the same way, where do you find Shakespeare in a play? Mm -hmm. You're going to, you're going to find him in the fact that there are words and that the story has a plot and it points to an author. Uh -huh. But if, if you're in the story, you don't look for like Shakespeare to be hiding behind a bush in the story, right? He's the sure. author of the story. Yeah. Um, in the same way, God by his very definition would be something that we're not going to be able to observe. He's not like hiding behind a tree or he's not like underneath mm. down in a cave or something like that. So obviously we wouldn't be able to observe him under a microscope. Do they understand that? Um, do you think, like, or do, is that something that they just misunderstand and therefore when they're asking these things, they're genuinely saying, I'd like for you to be able to prove this, but I'm, I, I haven't seen any proof. Or are they being kind, or, or is this, they're in the art of the debate and their goal is just to like kind of win and That's they're willing to use all means necessary? Very interesting question because every time I tell them, here's, here's, I call them philosophical naturalists. Mm -hmm. And then there's such a, there's a term called philosophical naturalism and methodological naturalism. I won't get into details, but philosophical naturalism is this. Their, their philosophy is naturalism. Mm -hmm. I won't believe in anything unless I see it through observation or through the natural order of things that I can discover, mm -hmm. right? So uh, when I ask them, well, what's, what, what, what leads you to that? conclusion what leads you to believe that's how you find truth mm -hmm. in other words what's your presupposition to that yeah it's a philosophy phil uh, philosophy yeah or for us a theology slash philosophy whatever so they're already beginning with philosophy you mentioned there's kind of a history or go ahead go ahead and finish your thought yeah th but that's that's the thing and they will never admit to that in fact mm -hmm. they'll all say we're we're not all say many of them will tell me uh we're not philosophers we're poor philosophers we're scientists we mm -hmm. prove by reality no there is a there is as much and i would even suggest more non-scientific philosophy going into your belief in a non-god and how this world existed than we as Christians. You want to walk through the history of that? Because I think the history shines a lot of light on that as, yep. as just kind of a, like a proof statement for what mm -hmm. you just said. Yeah, right. Epicurus back in the sec third and fourth century. BC, right? BC. Yeah. Yeah. Third, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, they already had some sense of atoms. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was around the fifth century in in the Greek philosophy, uh, or in the Greek Empire, where they started believing this idea of atoms. Really? Okay? Yes. And not not atoms like Adam and Eve. But no, no, no. Atoms, atoms like running. Yeah, we went around and randomly, very big word, uh, flying around and hitting each other in randomness, mm -hmm. and therefore that's how the world began. Epicurus believed that he was uh, a, a hedonist. Mm. And, and, and what's hedonism? That has to do with uh, seeking pleasure and not pain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for him, it was uh, avoid pain and fear. Mm -hmm. And his philosophy in general was uh, this world, it has all kinds of randomness to it. These He actually believed that these atoms are flying uh, against each other. And poof, here we are. Uh, not because of any designer uh -huh. or mind, but we're here purely because of chance. And therefore, what does that do? It sets up an idea of basically hedonism. So what's my what's my philosophy on life? You, know, you drink and be merry for tomorrow you die. So there's no, he, there's no greater cause than no, placed on No, no. In fact, he that was his thing. And he came up to the conclusion there is no God. Uh, any kind of beliefs in gods were... 
uh, fairy tales and his 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 and and he, his idea was when you come to realize that you have freedom mm -hmm. freedom to do what you want without any doesn't that sound familiar without any kind of god or deity by rules you have to follow you're not accountable to anyone you're not accountable and he, he that's basically what leads you to hedonism mm -hmm. that's absolutely what's happened and 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 that idea reemerged during the Enlightenment period, 17th, 18th century, when so was it was it popular back then? Not totally popular. Yeah. In fact, it didn't last very long. I think it was Stoicism or something that that kind of took it over. Or he was kind of a Stoic too, but something. But it, it lasted for a certain period of time. But it was a philosophy. Yeah. He wasn't a scientist. He was right. a philosopher. And there's this incredible book called Moral Darwinism. Mm -hmm. I, I highly recommend it. Do you remember who the author is? Benjamin Wick Wicker. Wicker, w i k e r. Okay. Somebody gave me that book. I read it, and that guy just li outlines Greek philosophy and then the Darwinian, supposedly scientific, dri science-driven Darwinianism, and they line up perfectly. Yeah. This, I mean, it, unbelievable. It's like it reemerged during the Enlightenment period where Darwinism came, mm -hmm. and it basically took the philosophy of Epicurus from well, several thousand years before mm -hmm. uh, and, and merged it. And, but, but it's, it's now under the guise of what science, which kind of makes it, it's almost like it has the, um, it has like the, the armor of science to make it exactly so challenge it. Exactly. And that it protects yes. this, right? Because I don't know all that much about Epicureanism, but I do know it shows up in uh, N.T. Wright's, biography on Paul, mm -hmm. right? So he, that's not his focus, but he mentions it a couple of times where it's brought in where Paul seems to ref, like be speaking against it. Mm -hmm. And the one thing N.T. Wright says is this was, this was like a back alley type philosophy. So the Greeks were serious philosophers. You know, yes, they, they, they really were, were great thinkers mm -hmm. and systematicians and all of this stuff. And Epicureanism was looked at by all of the great thinkers of old. And they were kind of like, that's, that's, a, that's cute. Mm -hmm. We can't really take it seriously. Yeah. And that was that was the case for the Greeks. It was the case for the Romans, and it, it was always there. But it was such a like it was never all that respected, right? And now it is. It's it's the god of philosophies. It's, it's the it's, most beautiful. Like that's what all the the real thinkers think. And right. everyone in history is like, you guys are bozos. That's exactly right. But to your point, it's hidden behind the science thing, where yeah. you say that seems like a really bad system, and they go, "Well, you're not a scientist." You go, exactly. Well. No, technically I'm not, but I know how to think, and that seems like a really bad system. And, right. and they, they don't say, yeah, let's talk about the systems. Right. Right. Let's talk about our philosophies and, and, and have it out. They say, they say, you've got blind faith, and I've got this kind yes, of science. Yes, and they, and they, they say, don't go there, and they, they mm -hmm. protect it. Now, yeah. whether, whether the person is, is, uh, knows that, because it's very interesting when I talk to these atheists, and a lot of these guys are really smart people. Mm -hmm. you know, they, and, and I always wonder, do you know what I'm getting at? Do you understand what I am saying? Because I am, I am trying to get to your foundation, mm -hmm. and they they hide from it. They nobody ever says yes. Uh, uh, this my my philosophy is there's no God. They'll mm -hmm. never do that. But it's science. It's not. It's it's unbelievable how they hide behind it. You know what I wonder if that that is. We talked a little bit about this, you know, over the course of this week, but. Um, you know, certainly one of one of the shticks I've I've big, it, very interested in, and some of our our guests have talked about this and stuff. But the shifts in education in the mm -hmm. certainly since the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. but certainly over the last hundred and twenty years in particular, have moved us away from understanding formal logic and philosophi. So right now you can go and you can get a PhD in bi biology, and you've never learned proper logic, right? Okay, now can you I still be a that. good? Could you can you still be a great? Um, can can you create a microwave or, or create right. a new medicine? Absolutely. I'm not saying that you have to know a formal logic or rhetoric mm -hmm. or to be great at debating philosophy in order to do that job. You can go make your $200,000 a year as a biologist and be a fantastic biologist, and I'm glad that you're here. And nobody's going to call that a religion. Right, right, right. right. But they're not trained in to where in the ancient world, certainly in the Greeks, but also in Christian history, we were trained in, in logic and mm -hmm. in systems and mm -hmm. in because we were debating philosophy, because philosophy is kind of an extension of theology, right? Um, and that's kind of our prime interest. To whereas you, at least at seminary, you, you've got some of that education, mm -hmm. which, but most people are not getting that formally. So to your point, you say, let's let's engage on this philosophy. 
mm-hmm. right? On kind of these macro questions of reality and does it make more sense that there's a God or not? Mm-hmm. And that's completely out of their realm of comfort. Like they might have a PhD and as you said, be very smart, but they're not trained in that. Mm-hmm. So to go into that realm, it's like that's, I don't one, I don't want to go there, but two, why would I have to go there? Because for me to do my job, I can just simply kind of be in this scientific method, non, you know, non-philosophical right. world. And that's their reality. And to your point, you're saying you are, when you're having these questions about is there a God, not a God, how did the world come into being, those are not scientific method type questions because you can't observe those things. Those that's have right. to be philosophy. And you can use science as a feeding, you know, it feeds into the philosophy. Those are data points you can play with. But you also have to be able to engage in the philosophical yes. uh, exercise. Yeah, and then we can talk about the fact that we are in a system, a scientism thing that's been happening and it's basically driven uh, by what I would call a religious cult of what they call it science and it's not because what you'll you'll find in the record how many scientists will ask the questions like what is there a limit to science mm-hmm. uh and if so what are they uh atheists will come after you just ask a guy by the name of eric hayden from the school that you had your undergrad work in ball state oh yeah yeah he just he had a he had a class and it was it was had great reviews by the students. They loved it. Mm-hmm. And it just, it, the class was about, is there limits to science? That's a good question. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was a radical group of atheists that that just ran him out of there. And he has a book on that too. So they kicked him out of Ball State. Yeah. Hmm. Because he was, he was asking the question that they so guard against. Now, you and I both know that if, if somebody's going to respond that way and not be able to answer the question, you know they're hiding something. Yeah. To the same reason why, and this is the same reason why as pastors, we shouldn't tell a person when they have a question, why is this so? And we just tell them, well, you just believe it. Mm-hmm. If I don't know the answer, then maybe I should find somebody who does yeah. and help that person out. You could just tell that they they if, if you're going to question the limits of science, you're going to get to the nucleus of what, what they're hiding. Mm-hmm. You know, they are a religion. I will go as far, and, and this is, boy, they would get mad at me when I tell them Darwinism is a religion. Mm-hmm. And they'll say, no, it's not, it's science. And we're back now to the faith versus science thing. Mm-hmm. And what, what really disappoints me is that we have lived for decades asking that question when we should be uh, uh, just comparing, basically comparing faith. Mm-hmm. Because go ahead, take take an atheist and says, I don't believe in God. And you take a Christian and says, I believe in God, right? We all look at kind of to the same point. We I think we hit a little we all look at the same data. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh there's no question that Darwinism, the idea of macroevolution, where we somehow evolved from a single cell out of the primordial soup, is based on a religious presupposition mm-hmm. that already begins with. I don't believe in God. Yep. And then they go, and then the whole setup is such that I'll never be able to discover God based on my setup because I indoctrinated myself as a philosophical naturalist. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to believe in anything except by nature. And then the real argument of God goes beyond science just by its very definition. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you could take, you could take anybody who believes in something, uh, Outside of naturalism, take a take a Hindu who believes everything is God, and and then there's the, the definition of divinity. Take a a Muslim, a Jew, a Christian. At least when we come up with these conclusions, we're not just basing it on science, mm-hmm. are we? There's something else going into it. So then the question is, will you be able to believe in God based on just the scientific method? By definition, you can't. Mm-hmm. That's where they stay. That's where they're comfortable. The good news is that I think it's starting to break up. I think that, I think it's I've, I've kind heard of the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these big guys like uh, you know, there's another great book called uh, "The Devil's Delusion," and it was in response to Richard Dawkins, one of the most prominent uh, new a- new atheists, um, "The God Delusion." And this this guy's a he's not even he's not a Christian. He's a um, uh, when you don't believe in you oh, kind not of sure. an agnostic. He's an agnostic. Yeah. And he writes this book that just totally shows this. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't have any religious bent. He's just saying, I'm, uh, 
based on the idea of he, he he basically tears apart the god delusion in 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 and and kind of uncovers this 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 secret yeah behind how they, they they've they've uh, packaged the argument and they've done it successfully for many years yeah yeah let me ask you this what's the best argument you've had an atheist pose against you the nihilist okay okay so uh there are honest atheists here here's the the, the atheists that i i guess to a certain extent a lot of atheists will say well if you get rid of your religion and you don't have to obey a god live life in the full for whatever you got mm -hmm. and that's true freedom that was basic they, that's epicurious you know okay um but i would suggest the honest atheist even though he's he's barking up the wrong tree, is the one who recognizes he's a nihilist. In other words, there is no meaning to life, and he's a pretty depressed individual in the end. And he will try to live life as, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, but he says in the end, there really is no meaning to life to the extent that he doesn't have hope, mm -hmm. and, he, and, and, he, and he admits it. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of atheists that do that. Um, those guys... They're at least honest. They're, yeah, they're honest with where they're at. Yeah, yeah, and there's no question, and that, that's that's kind of the point. You don't really have freedom when you leave God, and that's that's why people leave Christianity, and they they have this thing. Well, if I can get that monkey off my back, mm -hmm. then I can live life to the fullest, and uh, uh, I'm free. But they're not free. Yeah, the Nile. Yeah, yeah. What do, what do you think about Jordan Peterson? He's kind of an interesting character in that. I mean, because yeah. I don't, well, he believes in evolution, but he, he believes in evolution. He, he believes, comes from that, but I don't, I don't know exactly what he believes and, in. And that. there are a lot of Christians who believe in evolution. We could, we could talk right, about yeah. that as to why yeah. I suggest that just goes against the evolution, uh, evolution and Darwinian evolution and Christianity do not mix. But Jordan Peterson comes from that, you know, from the psychology and psychiatry and very interesting man to watch him is is really amazing because he comes right up to the door of christianity mm -hmm. and he's he's doing it through his science he'll look at christians and say why is it that the christian uh tackles the most important questions of our time why is it that they go why is it the christian goes that deep mm -hmm. into you know where other other avenues other ideologies don't Mm -hmm. you know, so he is wrestling with it. He also interprets the scriptures. He writes on the scriptures and how important they are. Mm -hmm. But uh, why he doesn't take that step. Oh, actually, there was that one point in which uh, Jordan Peterson kind of got emotional and said, basically, if Christ were who he said he was, if this is all true, it would be just so amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I pray that he'll take that step and say, hey, you know, it is true. So he sees the beauty is. of it, but maybe not the truth of it. Yeah. In in the sense of it being literal history, because he believes that truth is woven throughout the Bible, he would say, yes. but he doesn't necessarily see. He says the story of the crucifixion is true, but whether or not it's historically true is something different, which right. you know, it is kind of an interest, not interesting in that I would endorse that type of thinking. It's just interesting to watch someone be in a, in a situation like that. Right. And kind of the way that they look at things. Yeah, because the next step for him would be understanding the historicity of the scriptures and the historical reality of the resurrection mm -hmm. of Christ. And it changed everything. Yeah. And you're not going to find it in science, of course. You're going to find it in the truth of what has been prophesied throughout the scriptures, mm -hmm. which, again, we get back to uh, they say that it says it's the word of God and it proves it through all the prophetic mm -hmm. Uh, utterances of the old testament pointing to christ so mm -hmm. you know and then now we're now we're now we're up to where the christians should say as paul did if christ is risen that change if christ is not risen we we live in vain mm -hmm. right but since christ is risen it does change everything mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to take an experience because you go and find the corpses that are all buried in the ground are not risen from the dead but there is one who is and then promises resurrection for us as well, mm -hmm. those of us who are in Christ. So, yeah. yeah. And to your point, you know, if that's wrong, I want it to be proven wrong. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that's where, you know, to your point of, I want, I want this idea to be debated. I want a thoughtful atheist to go, not against me because I'm not the, I, you know, I'm not the brightest guy, but, you know, take a, take a Bishop Barron or take, you know, Jonathan Peugeot or take a, 
Adam Coons or Christian. Mm-hmm. I want I want the best Christian to go against the best atheist and then yeah. watch watch them debate their ideas. Mm-hmm. And I find over and over again when I see that my faith is cemented. I know you watch a lot of debates, but my faith is always cemented because I find that the Christians have thorough answers, mm-hmm. that they're not stepping into uncharted territory when they're trying to wrestle with these macro questions. Mm-hmm. And to your point with Jordan Peterson, he sees that Christianity answers these macro questions and it provides a, it provides a very reasonable explanation for why someone should have faith in yeah. what the Bible teaches. Right. And that is that's that's a firm foundation because if if the Christianity is not true and I spend my life endorsing something that is not true, that's mm-hmm. a that's a very much a wasted life. Or as Paul right. says, we should be pitied among all people. Like what what a foolish waste of life if right. we are wrong. And one of the big arguments of the atheists is, well the, there's all this suffering in the world, so there can't be a God, right? And mm-hmm. when you really that when you really understand Christianity, you have a you have an understanding of why suffering exists, mm-hmm. and you have an actual meaning to suffering. Atheists won't even give that to you, he'll, and it's and, and he'll, he'll he'll borrow from Christianity. Yeah, it's very interesting. He borrows a morality from Christianity, and then says, um, "Well, there, there since, since there's suffering, there is no God." And then you ask the, and and we have an answer for it, mm-hmm. and 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 Christ is the center of that answer. But the uh, atheist doesn't have an answer answer for it either. Yeah. So he goes, well, because there's suffering and death, there, there's no God. Um, and so I'm an atheist. Okay. All right. So what's your answer to suffering? Mm-hmm. They're basically saying, I'm lucky. And, and Richard Dawkins actually speaks of himself as the lucky one. Uh, we are the lucky ones, you and I now, because, boy, boy, there's been billions of years of Random selection, mutations, death, suffering to the degree of, I can imagine the amount of suffering if it were true. Mm-hmm. Well, there is suffering in the world, but they would propose suffering got us where we are. But we are the lucky ones. The, uh, the, the atheists, all they can say is if your, things are going good for you, you're lucky. Mm-hmm. That guy over there who's uh, in a wheelchair and can't walk, he's unlucky. He doesn't have an answer for the person who's suffering. Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting how that works, doesn't it? It's a very different view of the world, yeah. yeah. It's nihilistic. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's why the honest atheist is, is a nihilist. Mm-hmm. So what do you think about Christians who believe in evolution? Mm-hmm. Right. Which, I mean, maybe, maybe a decent amount of our audience falls into this camp. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly whole denominations will fall into this camp, at least being open to that idea. Right. right? Um, the Lutheran Church of Missouri said it is not one. We, 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 formally reject the idea of macro evolution and we right. kind of talked about that and mm-hmm. so what's what's your thoughts on that discussion that takes place between those you know someone like a bishop baron who i very mm-hmm. much look up to and he's he's not he's a, he's a thoughtful theologian and he's a thoughtful thinker mm-hmm. and he's he's certainly at least open to the idea of evolution c.s lewis one of my heroes mm-hmm. right? right he was very much open to the idea he found yeah. out this was a different time and it had some different nuances but mm-hmm. um so what's 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 the discussion? What's 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 each side thinking and wrestling with as they kind of tackle and, and go about this? Yeah, uh, I, this is now if if it's if it's Christianity, yeah, if atheists Christian, are not in right, this table. Atheists this are outside. Now we can start talking about the scriptures, right? Because mm-hmm. we both at least agree that the scriptures um, point to Christ, and we we have that as our source and norm. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, Occam's Razor says the the uh, Simplest answer is, is is the best. We go into the scriptures, and what you have, no matter how you look at it, the book of Genesis is that God creates, and it was good. It was tov. It was in harmony with God. It was an expression of God. Uh, and so he creates, it's good. Mm-hmm. Okay? And what you'll get from Christians is, well, the meaning of good isn't doesn't mean that we didn't have millions and billions of years of uh, animals suffering throughout this process to where we are now. So mm-hmm. they still, and they, that's one thing that's consistent about the old earth creationists or people who believe either in evolution or they're not, there's all kinds, there's all kinds of categories of what people believe, but the, the idea that there's, it's an, we're an older earth and there's some kind of process there in regards to that. Uh, they all come to the conclusion that there has been suffering and death throughout a long period of time. Mm-hmm. 
And the Bible just doesn't read that way. Mm-hmm. The Bible is so clear in that, in, in, in many ways. You can take the book of Gen- Genesis and say, okay, God creates and it is good. And then chapter three, everything goes bad in the fall. God creates everything that God does is always good. You try to find anywhere in scripture where he initiates anything evil or deadly or what have you. He might use it for his favor. Mm-hmm. But the basic story of the Bible is God has two main actions, doesn't he? He comes and he creates and he makes man in his image. He creates its good. Then when we fall into sin, what does he do? What's the next action? He recreates or he sends forth the image of God in the person of Jesus Christ and he brings resurrection. Mm -hmm. Those are the actions of God throughout the scripture. Find it different. You Mm -hmm. can't. So -hmm. God creates and he redeems. God brings forth um, ex nihilo, uh, existence out of nothing. Mm -hmm. He speaks it in. And when things go bad, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And the image of God is found in the person of Jesus Christ who brings resurrection from death. Mm -hmm. Life from nothing, resurrection from death. Those are the actions of God in the broadest sense. Then if you go into the details of this, what it means in the scriptures, you'll find it. There, There is no sense where God initiates anything evil in creation or redemption. Mm -hmm. Okay? And somebody may say, well, what about this situation where God allows? Yeah, God allows. He's actually manipulating evil Mm -hmm. to his will. And you can go to the cross and find that that reality that, yeah, evil puts Jesus on the cross. And uh, God wills Jesus to be the atonement for our sins so that he may what? Mm -hmm. Bring about resurrection. Yeah. An atonement. So to suggest that there is any way God has any, in any of his way of doing things that God subjects us because of his will to death or sickness or sin. It just doesn't exist in the, in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And anybody who tries to work that in is not looking at, at it, at its, at its, at its true word, at, it, at, at what is being, they have to manipulate and say, well, you know, uh, in, in this case it's different. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's not how the scriptures read at all. So what are some of the best um, explanations you've heard from from theologians that, that are open to kind of an old earth? Or I, I guess old earth isn't really your concern. Your concern is is death before the fall into sin. Right. Correct? Death, sin, mm-hmm. mutations, everything. everything Which evolution is it's, it, it's, it's necessary. It's a necessity. Yes, for there to be yes. death. Yeah. And, and, and then, then you'd have to... If, if, what, what's some of the best explanations you've heard kind of from the opposing side? From the opposing side? Um, it would be probably people who would suggest... Uh, and here again, they, they, they'll, they'll have to reconstruct Adam. Uh, Adam is not necessarily being a person who was... You know, where God actually took okay. sand on the ground and blew life into him, and there he was. Um Boy, that's that's a good question, because there's some guys I really respect, like William uh, Craig, who 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 actually is now moving towards a like uh, he's open to evolution too in the Old Testament. Oh, he is. Okay, uh, is that a new? So he used to be against. It no, now? I don't think he ever has, and and he's very critical uh, against young Earth creationists like mm-hmm. myself. Okay, um, he he thinks that we're a detriment to the promotion of Christianity because it's just not believable. Um. And I think they're, they're science driven. They're, they're accepting a lot of the things that we don't accept in regards to an older earth mm-hmm. that goes into, into it. So, um, that, that part, I just, I can't get past that, I guess. I'm trying to figure out what advantage or what positive thing it is to believe that there's death that brings, brings us to Adam. I just, mm-hmm. I just can't. Yeah. I, I really can't. Mm-hmm. Can you? Or? I'll give you one. And let you yeah. See. So, yeah. Um, so C.S. Lewis in um, Out of the Silent Planet. So that's the first of his the space trilogy that he writes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's usually called the space trilogy. Um, so Out of the Silent Planet, he has this picture. So he goes to um, Melicandra, and Melicandra is basically Mars in our language. And there he finds a world that's never fallen into sin. 
Okay, so you get kind of a picture of this. And the second one, he goes to Paralandra, which is uh, Venus, and that's a world that has not fallen into sin, but it's at, at its infancy. So they have an Adam and Eve type motif uh, okay. present in the story. But first book, Out of the Silent Planet, he's in Melicandra. It's without sin, all right? So none of the, there's no quarreling between the Sorms or the Harashna or the Fifiltrigi, which are the three kind of species that are there. Um, and when he's, he's with the, the, uh, he's with the Rasna and they're, they're kind of an interesting people, but one of their traditions is they go out to hunt what looks like a shark. Rachna is what it's called. And it's one of the things that they look forward to the most. It's one of the like liturgical practices of their year. Once a year, they go out to kill the Rachna and L ransoms the main character. And he's just, a, uh, he's a man. He's a philosopher, you know, he's a, um, uh, professor from earth who ends up there and when he's there he finds so he says oh it's like the, this is like the enemy but then he finds that they have like statues and stuff to the harakna so they love the harakna and they want to fight the harakna and he's very confused by this notion and he ends up kind of experiencing actually this he goes out with his friend that he makes and he becomes part of the hunt and um basically what 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 this picture is is they all know that there's something else to come and they have zero fear of death and death is something that they actually look forward to in many ways mm -hmm. because they understand that death is going to be what leads to the creator and the next stage of like eternity sort of, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, but with the danger that comes with the hunt comes one of the most exciting parts of their year, the aspect of going out for the hunt where I might go die, but I get to go, I get to go courageously. And he actually, he paints, he paints a very beautiful picture of how, Death and maybe death is a necessity for the virtue of courage and for facing the dangers. And that once you remove the fear of death, which is what plagues you and I, once you do that, then you kind of have like a different approach towards death. Like the actual mm -hmm. end of my biological life is not something worth fearing, which is kind of how a Christian would approach it, right? Mm -hmm. um, we would say, I no longer fear death. Um, but of course, we would make the caveat of we wouldn't say that death is good. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's a very interesting kind of picture. Now, does that answer like, you know, single celled amoebas eating each other? Like that's, it's right. kind of tough to get to that point, but at least he gives an explanation of going back and saying, okay, you know, I don't know, a, a monkey that fights the rhino or something stupid like that, yeah. right? That there's, if there's not the fear of death, that death can actually be something that's not, not sinful. So right. that's one of the best kind of pictures that I've, I've, I've heard of somebody who was obviously a very thoughtful theologian who knew Genesis one yeah. really well and, and did not, have a problem with evolution. Yeah. Uh, it, it's very interesting, but I would, I would suggest that, uh, as much as I very much respect Lewis mm -hmm. <laughs> as you do, uh, I think he's, he's still bringing in the, the notion of what happens because of sin and death. And that I would suggest had we not fallen into the sin, there'd be a whole different circumstance. So the other, the, in other words, the idea that the, the, no, the that, not having a fear of death is a noble thing. And what we should have as Christians, that all that part is true. But I would suggest he's still integrating post fall into that. Mm -hmm. So that he's still saying, he's still realizing what we have to challenge ourselves with because there is death. Mm -hmm. And the world, had we not fallen into sin, would have had its own category of whatever it is. And I don't necessarily believe that we even understand what that would be. Mm -hmm. So um, had we not fallen into sin, I don't, I don't think we have uh, an encroachment of death, of necessarily a fear of death. What it would have been like, I don't think we can even comprehend because we fell into sin, so we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So I think, and this comes back again to like kind of the Occam's razor thing, when you read the text, Mm -hmm. You don't get that. You don't. You, you you get you get death and sin, and you have God and Tove. Mm -hmm. and it was good, and there's no reference to anything that would suggest even beforehand. Now Luther, he he believed that in the Garden of Eden. To your point, there or his point, that the Garden of Eden was a test. Yeah, and and that there would be something more. Mm -hmm. And so it had we not, and it's always kind of uh, scary. It's dangerous sometimes had we not fallen into the sin, right? Mm -hmm. 
But I think we talked about this the other night. Had we not fallen into sin, we, we would still end up with the incarnate Christ in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we want to go there, but I don't think we can say we can borrow what we have to go through now and suggest that if, if there was a world that didn't fall into sin, those would have the hunt for this animal would exist. Mm -hmm. I think that that's going beyond what the, what the text is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're, you're saying basically that, you know, for that explanation by Lewis is one that starts with, starts with the explanation of evolution, which has been ad adapted and adopted. And maybe he's wrestling with, how can this make sense with a good God? And he's trying to give his best explanation for how that could work. And you're saying Occam's razor is simplest. The text doesn't really seem to show that. So why are we even going through the effort of trying to read that back in and give some kind of pre, pre Genesis one, Genesis two explanation to fit the evolutionary one? You're and saying it makes more simple just to reject it. And by the way, there's, there's a lot of biological reasons that we now know 60 years later that would, that, yeah. that yeah. help give credence to just pushing back against evolution and saying, right, just simply we reject it. Right. And I, I do believe a lot of this also comes from how, how you are educated. If you're educated in, in, in with mm -hmm. the evolutionary idea, a lot of people are saying, okay, this is lock stock and, and we have to make it fit. And yeah. at that point, it's still new. When Lewis is there, it's still new and it's still a novel idea. It's grown a little bit more old, I think, today. I don't want to say that there's like a huge exodus away from the idea, but you've got yeah. books like Behi, uh, Behi was it Darwin's Black Box and the Irreducible yeah. Complexity and the, the Intelligent the, Design people who are doing a great job. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of holes that have been been kicked yes. into things that in the 40s and 50s were just assumed. To be yeah, true. And another way to look at this. I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. uh, Darwinism. Darwin used a method. Even him himself would 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 have agreed to this. Is and, and this is what the Intelligent Design guys do. And and by the way, most of them are old Earth creationists. They're not. They're not Lutheran. I think out of all of the guys that got there, there's one young Earth guy in there. But mm -hmm. these are all science, not all science, but science and, and philosophy people. Okay. Um, but uh, Stephen Meyer is a really good guy to check out. He wrote a book called Signature in the Cell. Mm -hmm. And his contention is he comes out with intelligent design. He comes with a theory called intelligent design. In other words, when you look at everything that's going on, he uses the words, Inference to the best explanation, and mm -hmm. he says, "This is I'm doing exactly what Darwin's doing." Mm -hmm. In other words, I can't prove it like the microwave, but and he and if you and, and you read his book, Signature in the Cell, he's going to tell you what's happening in the cell. Behe does the same thing. Mm -hmm. He looked into the he looked at and he's got this thing called irreducible complexity. When yeah. he realizes he looks at the molecule, and there's no way that could have evolved because they're irreducibly complex. Can you, can you explain? Yeah. You want to keep on, but at least circle back and explain that in some detail, because I think that's a big Yeah, yeah. Point. Behe came, uh, and, and, and he actually believes in evolution, too. But, okay. But not in, in the, he thinks it's guided. He, said, he says it has to be guided. There has to be these big By jumps. an intelligent, right. yes, because yeah. by intelligence, because he just looked into the, the molecule. And he'll tell you how he was he was trained to believe in evolution, and, and they never really necessarily questioned it. But he looked into the molecule, and he realized that the molecule is irreducibly complex. And what he says is, picture an outdoor motor on a boat. And uh, that thing is going to run. It's going to move your boat. It's going to cause the propeller to go so you can take off. But every component of that motor is 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 reliant on the the functioning of the other part of that mm -hmm. motor so that if you take one piece of it away the motor's not going to work. Mm -hmm. He in discovering the molecule says that's how the molecule works. So there could not have been an evolution to bring forth the molecule because there's already an irid you can't make it less complex than it is as you see it now. Mm -hmm. So some kind of intelligence had to made that happen, just like some type of intelligence builds an outdoor motor. Mm -hmm. So it's irreducibly complex. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that did a... a, a, a so why does that poke a hole in some of the evolutionary ideas? Because there, you can't prove an evolutionary process to get to the molecule. Because mm -hmm. each one of the subsets of that molecule, uh, the, it, you couldn't have the molecule because... If you took one part out, it wouldn't function as it does right now. So it could not have evolved to the to that complexity. So, in other words, if you've got 
if you've got because he talks about right is it like like the smallest components mm-hmm. and is that alleles is that the right word uh, i think so okay I mean, i'm not sure yeah, yeah. We're, we're this is we're not we're scientists, not scientists yeah. but um but he, he right he, that's why i'm glad you picked the picture of kind of like a machine because we can all picture that to where yeah. we cannot picture yeah. the structure of a cell but he can right so if you've got to have 120 pieces and i that number sticks and i think that's one of like the base you still have my book don't you i think so yeah, yeah. it's uh yeah. it's not over there but you took it and never yeah. returned it yeah <laughs> which had all your notes in it by the way but something like 120 and for you to get the zero to 120 the normal evolutionary idea is well how do you get there well you go one two three four five six seven and then you get to 120 right right because you can have you can have it takes it every once in a while there's a little mutation or something that can make and that's a whole other thing right but but maybe you can get from one to two but his point is you would have to have 120 specific mutations that all happen to come together well, at exactly at, at the, the same, same time, time, which is impossible. Because right? if you had 111 right. come together, which would be a miracle. If right. you had five come together, it'd be almost a miracle. Right. But that what? 120 come together all at once, because if it's one less, it dies and then you restart. Yeah. So it's not like you have 110 and you only need 10 more. And it's like, well, we'll give it, give it another million years and we'll get the last 10. It's exactly. Like, no, the thing dies and then you restart. Right. Right. And so here we go. Inference to the best explanation. What would the inference to the best explanation be? Darwin wasn't looking at that. He saw a cell as one big glob. He did. He did. He thought it was going to be a simple thing when we got into the cell. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the inference of the best explanation? Evolution or design? Intelligent design, just like an outdoor motor. Mm-hmm. Well, can you prove it like a microwave? No. But what's an inference of the best explanation. That's all that Darwin did. Mm -hmm. And so this is why there's philosophy and presuppositions and assumptions that go into each one of these ideas. Mm -hmm. Intelligent design, yep. Darwinism, yep. Think about what goes behind or underneath with assumptions and presuppositions, Mm -hmm. those theories. They're philosophical. You might be thinking... uh, but the bottom line for 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 Behe is that was not evolved. It mm-hmm. could not the evolution process, as Darwin speaks of it, could not have. Now that we now that we can look in the molecule, that is the case. Science has actually disproved the explanation. Is that uh, that? Now that they have new technology, they can actually look yeah, into. Yeah, I would say no I would say it's disproved. But yeah. just give the other side credit. We're both doing the same thing, and that's mm-hmm. that's the point that I want to really make in this thing is we're both assuming. Yep. And yeah, to me, you look at the molecule and it's like. Yeah, design. I don't even need, I don't need the Bible for that. The mm-hmm. idea of of look at the anthropic principles and how everything is exactly the way it should be, and you you do the math and what's the chances of this all happening randomly? And mm-hmm. they give you you know ten to the ninety third or whatever it is, basically impossible, right? Mm-hmm. And so I haven't proved it like a microwave, but boy, inference to the best explanation says the intelligent design folks and. Mm-hmm. Dave Meyer does a really good good job in that another book that you might want to read, and that is uh, Signature in the Cell. Okay, yep, that's what they do. Mm-hmm. And 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 to to Doctor Meyer's point is that's that's what Darwin did. Yeah. So right there, I mean, let, let let's let's make that the debate. Let's put Stephen Meyer in there and, and Richard Dawkins, whoever we wanted, and talk about that. And they mm-hmm. don't they don't want to talk about that. Yeah. They won't talk about that for the very reason we started this conversation. Yeah. So in summary, could you give just an explanation of? What does the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod believe when it comes to uh, creation? Yeah. If you just give a, a nice summary set, someone who's wondering what does the LCMS believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 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 uh, go ahead and check out everybody else, and we'll look at the data, and we'll explain it to you, and, and we'll take scientific data and talk about it, okay? We'll, we'll look at how we believed in how the strata is, is, is put together and everything. We have a scientific explanation to a certain – go to Answers in Genesis uh, – uh, young Earth creation people, and they'll give you a. This is what we believe, but they'll say we believe this because we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, mm-hmm. and we don't start with science; we start with theology. Mm-hmm. But um, if you want to go see how 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 we see the data out there, we'll give you our interpretation of that. Right? Mm-hmm. But the Lutheran Church looks at the Scriptures. It it says this about the scriptures, Genesis as Exodus as the four Gospels, and most of your books are historical narratives. There are parts in the scriptures where you have poetic language. You have uh, you have when Jesus has a parable, even within the 
historical narrative. You have Jesus speaking about a parable, and then you have to look at the symbolism within it. Okay, mm -hmm. But um, in the historical narratives, what do we have? We have God in six days creating. And on the sixth day, after creating all these other days, the last thing he creates is man. And he creates them all according to their kind. And he says it was good each day. It's good in harmony with God. Sickness, death, do not cooperate with God mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form is, is the bottom line what that says, the Akamarazi, if, if you will. And in the end, God creates man, and the, 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 the language changes when, when you get to 20, verse 26, I believe, of chapter 1, right? Mm -hmm. Let us make man in our image. So there's this distinction with man. Uh, and then God says, let's let me make a male and female, you know, and, and the whole thing. So that man then becomes the greatest of his creation and uh, really the reason why he created. And there's relationship with the animals. There's uh, one, one of the parts that blows my mind about the scriptures is when when uh, Moses writes, he creates the, the, the greater light and the lesser light, the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, this verse, and then he threw a bunch of stars in the sky. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at the star, stars in the sky and what they really represent and how many there are, mm -hmm. you know, I think that lends to, because I want him to talk about those stars more. Cause that's very, very interesting. Yeah. You know, and just the vastness of that creation. But he, that's, not, that's not his point. Mm -hmm. He's getting to, and then God created man in his image. And that, that is a loaded conversation right there. And then the whole idea is, okay, God is now going to test Adam and Eve. Don't eat of this tree. Um, uh, you can eat of these trees. And basically saying, do I have your best interest in mind? Mm -hmm. I'm God. I created you. In our, Do I have your best interest? Yes, I do, right? And then the whole Satan comes around and says, no, you should be independent of God. He's really uh, testing you. He's saying... You ought to follow him, but you really ought not to. You ought to claim your own independence. And they bit, bit into it. They mm -hmm. started blaming each other. And right away you have the whole sin-infested world in a relationship between Adam and Eve that have to now cover themselves because they realize they're naked. Mm -hmm. And then uh, God says, yep, life is going to be tough. You're going to suffer. And that's we, we need to, by the way, talk about the suffering of, of humanity because there's a meaning behind it. But you're going to suffer. Life is going to be rough. Uh, but I'm going to send a seed mm. and it's a singular seed. And right there amongst all of the havoc of the fall is I love you. And I'm going to give to you from the seed of Eve, from the seed of the woman will come the savior. And this is where I tell the Christian now look into that erupting within the whole old Testament. This story is going to be told through the, the people of Israel. And we're going to start, you know, we'll, we'll have the Noah thing and everything. We're going to have a, a Abraham being called and chosen and and uh, and all the prophetic utterances of the Old Testament. And all of it points to the Christ, points to the promise that God made that I'm going to redeem you because of, of, of that love. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, Christ comes and, you know, pays for the sins of the world and then resurrects and gives us the great, wonderful, blessed peace and hope. Uh, and hope, not in I hope so, but it's a confident hope mm -hmm. that God it has made everything and his will will be done for our lives in his image. Mm -hmm. And there's that kingdom of God to come because of his grace and his mercy. Mm -hmm. And the hardship and suffering in that narrative was post fall, post, post rejection, fall. post sin. Yes. And, and it and, has an end point. Right. And and here's the deal. Again, uh, that's the only thing I know. Mm -hmm. I was conceived in it, right? I don't know life outside of sin. I can't even grasp it. I can I can try, you know, but here I have to deal with that. I have to deal with the evil of the world. I have to deal with the ramifications of Satan's lie in my life, I have to deal with the sin, uh, as I journey to that which God has already claimed for me in Christ, mm -hmm. and uh, and and it's post. It's all has to do with evil and the fall, mm -hmm. and the promise that you will what die. Mm -hmm. You will die, and I'm going to send you somebody to take you out of death. The mm -hmm. Savior will come, 
And I just, I just, I just, you know, if there's kids watching, if there's uh, high school kids or college kids, uh, this is not a blind faith. Mm -hmm. When we start talking about, yes, there is a God, go ahead, intelligent design. Yeah, makes sense to me. But when you get into the scripture, you get into God actually through his word telling you this is true. And I'm telling you, and I tell the kids, they don't believe me in, in confirmation class, but I always tell them, because it's early in the morning, it's the first, we, we go through the Old and New Testament with the 7th and 8th graders. Mm -hmm. And I keep telling them, what we're learning here is, this is better than Disney World. Mm -hmm. And I force them to memorize. In the Old Testament, the New Testament is concealed. In the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed. I taught you that too mm -hmm. as a kid. Uh, go check it out. Because we do not have a blind faith. Mm -hmm. We have, do not have a blind faith. We have the scriptures that point to it. And, and it's if you study it, you'll see it. You'll see it. Mm -hmm. So, no, um, uh, you know, does science have a limit? You better believe it does. It's the natural order of things. The natural order of things is fine. God gives me four seasons. He enables me to know when to plant the crops, right? And uh, where I can expect spring and summer and then the harvest time. There's the natural order of things is a wonderful thing. That's how we live and we can live and have our being. But uh, science cannot prove any of that. But knowledge doesn't only come from science. Yeah, It, it comes from, uh, of course, the word of God as Christians because God gave that to us. Mm -hmm. And that's our source and norm. Mm-hmm. All right, let's circle back to uh, Kenya. Yeah, a little bit. I want, to, I want you to kind of take the time to to lay out how that's been successful, what made it successful, and why you think that's this is kind of a good model for people to explore as they're thinking about missions. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's something uh, I think the LCMS or church body should 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 look at. It. How do we do missions? And I'm a proponent of of involving getting individual congregations involved in missions uh, hands-on to where they relate to the missionary and the mission at hand. Mm -hmm. and so that's always been my dream. When I came out of seminary, I've always had this vision of, and I was so glad that they gave me my, the responsibility of evangelism and missions at Emmanuel. Uh, it was like a godsend for me because I've always thought about having our congregation or a congregation directly involved with a mission, not just, I remember when I was a kid and uh, I used to go to Sunday school and I put my quarter in my mission thing. And, and, and that was part of my, uh, what do you call it? Allowance as a kid, my mm -hmm. mom maybe gave me a dollar a week or whatever. Uh, and I would think I was always like, okay, my quarter is going to go to missions. Uh, and, Later on, I just discovered that it went to the district, which is fine. But I can remember even back then, I'm thinking, well, I thought it was going to go to help save somebody in Africa or whatever, you know, directly. Mm -hmm. uh, and and these things are fine. I'm not trying to knock the idea that we go to the district and district takes care. In fact, I would like to see the either from a district level or even better, the synodical level, to where they could facilitate churches to... Uh, be directly involved in missions like what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And what we are doing uh, is, again, I mentioned that that we set up a different, a, a certain type of uh, philosophy behind, behind mission trips. So uh, right now we've been, since 2009, we've been doing mission trips since 2001. We did it for Jamaica three times and went to China once and nothing really materialized, but with, with Africa it did in Kenya. Uh, where we go, we get a mission team, we go over there and uh, and do a mission, bring it back and bring it back to the church and actually have something concrete that happens out of it. So what we do in, e in Emmanuel is I've got a three-point objective for our missions. Number one, we get a mission team together and it takes about eight months. You've been on several of them. Mm -hmm. In fact, you went to Jamaica with me as a little, like a 12-year-old yep, at the yeah. time. Uh, we we get a team together, and number one, we become servants of the mission and help them out in whatever ways they want us to help them out. And number two, we grow spiritually as a group and individuals, in other words. And that's my major role as a pastor is to 
really uh, be be their pastor over there while we're while we're in at at Point of Grace Kenya and help them to develop and understand that they can do more to in, in missions than they think. Mm -hmm. And then number three, we bring it home to our congregation with something very concrete. So we get a team together, we go over there, we do vacation Bible school, and, and the mission over there has to do with uh, Pastor Meeker, Pastor Den Dennis Meeker, and his wife, Lorna. Lorna is a native uh, uh, Kenyan. Yeah. Pastor Meeker's from Iowa, and the two of them met at seminary. So she's a deaconess, Lorna, mm -hmm. and, and Pastor Meeker, of course, is a pastor. They live over there, in, and... Uh, they have developed what would start out with was uh, uh, the the Meekers had a church right up against the Kibera slums, mm -hmm. and in the Kibera slums, we're talking slums. There was a one point five million people in one square mile, tightly packed, bad smelling, terrible. AIDS epidemic happens in in Africa. It devastates the community. Mm -hmm. Many adults die, so there's a many orphans. They start collecting orphans while they're over there, the Meekers, and they had a house. When we went there the first time, there was a, about 40 kids in this house. Wow. Yeah, and they're, they're taking care of these kids. And that mission has developed to what is now 800 kids up by Lake Victoria near a town called Kasumu, and uh, with a school, both a uh, K through eight school, a high school, uh, uh, dorms, kitchen, all kinds of buildings built in the course since 2009 to today. And we've been a part of it, and we're, we're just a part of this thing. There's other churches that are involved. And uh, through the mission trips that started in 2009 all the way up to the present, again, we go there, and we have basically children that need our help, orphans, some with AIDS, and just uh, being able to bring these kids to a school, to a place where they're loved, where they're, where, they're, where they're baptized and they're raised in a Christian environment. They're schooled so that they can get out of the poverty. And uh, they go through, through the, from, from preschool all the way to graduation. And we need people to help sponsor that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the cycle. We go, take a team, do the VBS, help build things. Uh, people who go on a mission team, and I think you can contest to this, it mm -hmm. kind of changes you a lot because you go into a culture, a third world culture, where you see the poverty. And that's that's what I want. I want our members to have a relationship with them, have a relationship with the children that are there, have mm -hmm. a relationship with the teachers and, of course, the meekers. And this bond, this relationship happens to where they come back and they tell other members of Emmanuel what's going on there. And that other member of Emmanuel goes, Joe went there and did that, and uh, maybe I can do it too, or maybe I can sponsor a child. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've done. We've grown a sponsorship program. And over the course of these years, our outreach to Point of Grace Academy has become now part of the fabric of our church so that um, if you say Emmanuel Lutheran Church, mm -hmm. you will say Central Lutheran School, big part of our, our ministry there. You'll say the food bank. We have a food bank. We have a rummage sale. Mm -hmm. or do you remember those rummage sales uh, when you were over there? And they'll say Kenya. We do Point of Grace Kenya. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, if uh, that's what we do in missions so that I don't just give money to missions, which I'm all for because I can't do everything, mm -hmm. right? But that each church of, 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 let's say, our synod gets assigned or it gets to pick different and get, get have a relationship with a missionary and what it is that that missionary is trying to do in all these different parts of the world mm -hmm. and get directly connected with them in the mission mm -hmm. and build relationships and things like that. So... Um, and that's what's happened, and and that's something I think would be very wonderful. I think our synod could facilitate that, yeah, because they know what's going on. They know where the missionaries are, you know, all around the world. And what if uh, a good number of our our congregations 
again, when they, and people always struggle with what can we do with missions? What can we do with missions? What if you got connected with that and had meaningful mission trips to where you build that kind of relationship and help them in a concrete way to promote the gospel? Mm -hmm. uh, and for our, in our situation, we pro promote the gospel to the community that's there. And of course, these children that are being brought out of poverty into a safe environment uh, where, where they learn the love of Christ. And to your point, I mean, there's always been questions as far as the uh, the validity of going on mission trips mm -hmm. and the pushback against mission trips, I think is completely valid in mm -hmm. that lots of times you just, you're like, okay, you just spent whatever $18,000 for, you know, a group of 15 people to go and they kind of go on this, you know, 10 day mission trip and then they leave and they come back home and how much effect did that have there? And it's like, if you could just give the money there, you would do more. And yes. that's, that's, yeah. I think absolutely correct. Yeah. And I know you agree with mm -hmm. that, but on the flip side, there is a way that you can do missions right. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I shouldn't say most of the time, but I don't know. But a lot of the time, missions are done wrong. And they're done in that kind of tourist way where people get to go and they get to have their experience. They get to take their pictures. And then they come back and there's no lasting kind of sustainable uh, right. structure there locally. But the way that, that you guys have done this and churches could certainly do it is you also understand that you do need people to go over and have that experience or else it's mm -hmm. kind of like what you were like as a child where you say, okay, put my quarter in. And something good's happening somewhere. I don't know what it is. Right. And maybe I got a picture or maybe I got a letter, but mm -hmm. th there's no real tangible connection to where exactly what you do in the mission trip when it's done right as you have done it is those people, as you said, go and they have that experience. Mm -hmm. And you are always articulate on those trips that this isn't the main thrust. It's not as if you're going there to build something that they can't build themselves. Cause of course they've got, they can, they can build their own towers. They don't need mm -hmm. you to come as, as like this, this you know experienced American that can come and build yeah. a tower for them or whatnot, but they want the relationship over there yeah. and they desire the relationship. Yeah. And when someone goes on and they have that relationship and that experience, then that that Christian unity then catches fire, and then mm -hmm. the people come back. And you said they then become ambassadors for it. Right. Whereas if you just go right. in front and and you do it once a month and you go in front of the church and you say, "Here's how important this mission is." Yeah, some people there's the handful that will become energized right away. There's the majority of people whose eyes will glaze over, especially when they've heard it before. Yeah. But if Joe goes on the trip and then comes back and then Joe goes and, you know, gets dinner with the same people he gets dinner with and he's he's been moved by this experience and now he's talking about it, that's how people catch it because yeah. they know Joe and they know what Joe was like before and after and the experience that it had on him. Right. He can articulate what he saw, what he yeah. smelled, all of that. Exactly. And that's how it spreads. And mm -hmm. I think that's what you're, well, that is what you're saying is that that's what's allowed it to become part of the fabric of Emmanuel. And if you didn't yeah. have that experience, if you just preached the most eloquent sermon once a month about the importance of point of grace in Kenya, it would not have caught in the way that it did. Right. You're hands-on, and it's really wonderful to watch. I have a, several examples, and that would be where, when, when somebody has a sponsor, we, we come back and say, here are the children. We'll put all the pictures of all the children that need sponsors to help them through this. They pick a child. And then they can write letters to each other. They mm -hmm. have they begin a relationship with that child. They send monthly amount of money. Uh, and then you have one that, let's say, picks a child and says, you know what, Pastor, I want to go on a mission trip. And they're usually pretty humble in that because people are really afraid to go on a mission trip. And, they're, and, that, and, and I like that aspect of it so that we can um, uh, really learn that being a part of a mission trip is not as complicated as you think it is. But they go over there, and let's say they have a sponsor. They go over there, and they meet their sponsor child. Mm -hmm. And I'll sit back and watch that, and it'll bring tears to your eyes to watch. They hug, and then the child. And sometimes I feel inadequate. I know some of the sponsors who I went over there, they, they, they look at me as their father now or their mother now, and I'm not doing those kinds yeah. of things. I'm, always, I'm there for a couple of weeks, but I've now established this relationship. Um, I'll tell your viewers, when you went over there, um, there was this group of young ladies that just gravitated to mm -hmm. you, and uh, it was kind of interesting. I won't tell some of the details of uh, to embarrass you, but they really, really liked you a lot. And uh, these are like five, six year olds, so, so young ladies. No, they weren't. They were. Well, older. when I first met them, right? Were they? Oh yeah, the first time I went when I was, uh, I just graduated from college, so that would have been twelve years ago, eleven years ago. That's when I first is that made right? Contact. Okay, I always then, I, I guess since then now they're seniors in high school. Yeah, right. So they're well. I I went back minus six. They were five or six. Right. So I go back a couple years after you were there. And hi, how are you? 
where's Brian? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where's Brian? And then we had to do some kind of video thing with you because you were a rock star over there, you know, but they, uh, they really looked up to you, but it, it's, it, that part is just very moving to watch people go to, to point of grace and see it. And then they come home, they come home changed. Mm -hmm. And, and like you said, other members see it and it has grown substantially and in fact, the last time we we went on a mission trip, we went six times now, and then the seventh time we went with the with the church that you were uh, called to from seminary because mm -hmm. you planted the seed over there, and so we took people from uh, Nashua, New Hampshire, Grace Lutheran Church, because we're at a point now where uh, I want other churches to be able to adopt this kind of a program. So we went over there, and since we have developed a a whole plan from beginning to end from those three objectives where, which I teach them all the way to what it's going to take for you to get a visa and what to pack and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So we go through a, we have basically a program uh, in getting this team together. So we went over there uh, and flew over there a few times and, and worked through it. And so, so now another team, uh, Grace, Grace Lutheran Church in Nashua has adopted that mm -hmm. as a part of of their mission too. And so they caught the vision. So it's my prayer and mom's prayer, Carla, my, my wife, your mom, uh, to, to maybe start working on other churches and getting them involved in the same way. Cause again, to the initial point, I think this is a great way to do missions and make mission trips mean something more than a photo op. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't want to fool ourselves into thinking, that we're necessarily helping unless you can see that there's a relationship that is, is being formed. Yeah. The sustainability. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 And they want the relationship. I know you, you've said before, you always ask, should we just send you this money? Mm -hmm. and, you know, should we come back every, cause you guys go, usually go every two years. Cause, and, cause I always question it. And, and Lorna, Lorna, bless her heart. Uh, she's one of the most humble people I've ever met. Uh, yeah. She's just an amazing woman. And I told her that I said, you know, this costs us, and and it's not eighteen thousand; it's more like forty thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, but the good thing is, we're actually able to to help them through that money too, because they now have a facility to house us. Mm -hmm. So that, it that, promotes their business. Yeah, and stuff yeah. Too, so, so it's really good. Yeah. But it wasn't like that in the past. And there were times I would question. I'd say, Lorna, be honest with me. Uh, we can send you this money. We don't have to send it to you. And she was adamant. No, no. This is for. This is this will do it. This will do it. This you need to do this. And Did, uh, didn't she kind of get stern and say you're thinking like a Westerner? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like she, you're thinking. She, you're only thinking about dollars. And uh, you're only thinking about dollars. Yeah. And here it is. And it would have you know finance. Here's take this money and do what you want. Do it. Well, I know she's going to do it for the right reasons. Yeah, but yeah. spend it the way you want, as opposed to not getting that. Yeah. And no, she she told me that these relationships. This is all a very important thing, and it is. And every time we go there, there's just more members of our congregation that have experienced it. Mm -hmm. And then we have a mission festival every every time we come back and we present it to the congregation. And more and more people sponsor children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's 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 a really good thing. And so, wouldn't it be wonderful if, let's say, all the churches, because this helps the church too. It helps us grow mm -hmm. in Christ it, when there's that concrete relationship that exists. And uh, wouldn't it be wonderful? My pie in the sky idea would be that the Synod knows where all of our missionaries are, right? And, you know, every church gets the opportunity to say, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, get, in, I'll get in contact with this missionary. And every one of them would be different because there's needs all over the world. Mm -hmm. But then you have that kind of thing where you go and you see the people, you maybe you bring them back to you. I thought about what it would be like to bring some of these students back over here. And there's pros and cons to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so that you could see, you could take a look at that young lady who was in poverty and you can see mm -hmm. you know, where she's at right now. And you see flesh and blood. You see that born or a new Christian in, in a child, mm -hmm. you know, and then just to hear the reports of what they do and have our congregation hear the reports of what they do and go out there and be a part of it. I think that would bring missions alive to many churches in our synod. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Having experienced it, it's, it's potent. Yeah. 
So let me ask you, I think we're getting close to the end of time. Um, I haven't been looking at the comment section as we've been watching this, but I can already hear what the questions might be. And I think one that people ask is, uh, what are the 12? What are the 12 scotches that you have? Got to name them all? Yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about them. Man, I don't have to tell you about them. Come on. That's, you gotta remember. I'll tell you about them. Uh, <laughs> there's the McAllen 12. There's the... Uh, I, the Quinta Rubin well, let's ask you, let's, let's, So what are the categories? Because you've got different categories. Yeah, in well, scotch. they're the more fruity ones. So the Macallan. So, you, very, so you've got your more fruity ones. Yeah, and, they and would, then you've they got would your PD. Is there two categories or would you, how would you No, there's, there's No, there's a mixture. Some of them have like really balanced. Uh, yeah, you got the, if you go to the Highlands, the, they, mm-hmm. they don't use peat very much. In fact, okay. So you'll, you'll have. And what is peat? Peat is dead weeds. Okay. They'll go out and they'll cut it out in the ground, and it's basically dead weeds that they dry out. And then, when what you do is you take barley and you fool the barley. You get the, you get them wet, and and they then they uh, they molt, mm-hmm. and it opens up where the sugar is. See, mm-hmm. and then you got to dry them out. Well, if you have if you want a peated whiskey. You, that's where you put them, you burn the peat underneath them. And that peat smoky smell goes into the, 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 the barley, the malt, the malt. Mm. And then it gets crushed and then, then it gets, uh, well, then you gotta, then you gotta ferment it and add the yeast and all. And, and then you gotta put it through the distillery where they, they heat it up and mm-hmm. it uh, evaporates and it condenses into, into your whiskey. So it already has the peat flavor by the time it's been distilled. Yeah. You get the peat when, when you're drying, actually drying out the bar with it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you can have different degrees of it. If you go to, like you said, Lebroig or Ardbeg and those kinds of, mm-hmm. you're going to have the heavy peat. And those are the Islas. Those are the Islas. Now, if you want a really good balanced one, the Highland Park 12, mm. I think it's one of my favorites because mm-hmm. you'll have a little bit of peat. You won't have this overbearing peat. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, then again, you know, then you have the blended scotches, which is for, for me, it's pretty much the, um, what do I have? The, Johnny, Walker. Johnny Walker's black and green, black and green. Mm-hmm. Green is a, you, we, you, and, I, you and I had green together yeah. I think the last time we were, and that was, that's a combination of four single malt scotches put together. Mm-hmm. And one of them is a uh, is a is a peated one. I'm trying to remember which one. The Talisker. Right? Talisker. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a 15 year, so it's a minimum of 15 year. Whenever you have an age statement on, all it. the greens are. The green is 15. So if you yeah. buy a Talisker, very interesting. I've had a Talisker 10. I think you've tried that. Yes. Yeah. It's been aging in barrels for 10 years. Uh, they had to give they had to give Johnny Walker 15 year old stuff or older. Wow. Because if you have an age statement, it's got to be at least that. Mm-hmm. So. Those are fifteen-year-old scotches uh, in there. Uh, that there are four of them that are blended together. Mm-hmm. Then you got the Springbank, which I think is one that's of my kind of an interesting too. story. Yeah. So what's the Springbank? Springbank, you know, I, I investigate these things. So I, I go on, and then these people take tours on it. The Springbank is they do it the old-fashioned way as much as you can. Instead, of it's not so automated. They actually take the uh, barley and they spread it by hand, by shovel. So they do it the old way. Mm-hmm. So I was impressed by that. And so I wanted to buy one of their bottles. And so I, I went with the 15-year-old Spring Bank. And that is one of my favorites too. If your mother's watching this for the last couple of three years, that's been her birthday present for me. My birthday's coming up. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping she gets me another bottle of that. Because that's that's one of my favorites. It's got this. Uh, oh man, how do you describe it? Almost like this, and it sounds gross, but this iodine type taste to it. That's uh, but it's, it's a natural. Unique. It's not a. It's not a chemical. It's right. So it's oh so no, that flavor none of this kind of a beauty yeah, to it. Yeah, the only where place where they do chemicals is some of them will add coloring, mm-hmm. and uh, and some of them don't though. Yeah, and they'll also filter it. Uh, some of them won't. Spring Bank is not filtered. I appreciate that too. Yeah. Uh, so there's twelve of them. There's the. I don't know if I can name them all right. Oh uh, yeah, my the elders at our church bless their heart. Uh, they gave me a twenty five year old bottle. 
at my 25th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So the elders got together and I got that and I just take a little bit of that at a time because it was a very expensive bottle. Yeah. Uh, you yes. had it. You had it. I did, I, you yeah. you were at the place. We you were there. And in fact, you preached that day. So remember, we were on the fire and we tasted it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was good. Let's let's maybe put it this way: instead of the whole twelve, uh, leave that one aside because if any of your elders are listening, I don't want you to have to rate that one with with any of the others. So that okay. one aside, your other twelve. Uh, what would be your three favorites? Quinta Rubin. Yep, that's the Glen Moore and she Quinta Rubin with the. Uh, the port barrels mm -hmm. and that coloring is natural. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a red coloring in there. Oh, the Glenlivet 18. I have an 18 year old Glenlivet. Mm -hmm. That is the most complex one I've got and has a long lasting flavor to it. Beautiful. That was too complex for me. I'm I too, don't think I'm too much of a simple thing. That's the thing. You young guys come in there. I remember I, I, sh I shared it with you and mm -hmm. you and your brother and, and Tommy, my Tommy, brother-in-law, they kind of, but you guys kind of passed that one by and you guys like gravitated to the PD ones. Yeah. You know, the ones that uh, punch you in your teeth. Punch you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I used to, but I'm, yeah. So I, I would say the Glen, Glen live at 18 spring bank. And then I would suggest my Highland Park 12. Okay. Yeah. Bunahabin, though. Bunahabin's That's good. Your, got, the one I got for you. Bunahabin's really good. So give me five. I'll, get, I'll throw okay. that one in there, too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that if you're listening, that's that's the recommendation of someone who knows scotch. <laughs> for someone that does not know scotch, I would go with the Ardbeg Anoa, the Lafroy 10. Let's see. Lagavulin's really good. Yeah. If if you go to Scotland, you just need to go to the Isles. I would just hang out on the Isles and think of your daughter, mm -hmm. Eilie. Who, you, yeah. yeah, yeah. I like yeah. ones that just kind of punch you in your mouth. Yeah. Well, as you get older, your palate will get better. <laughs> as you get older, you get wiser. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for thanks. coming on. This was a thanks lot of fun for having me, son. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate everything you're doing here. I love this podcast. I love watching you do this. It's, it's a great thing. It's fun. Help us. And as always, special thanks to Bennett Stanchfield. As he hey, Bennett, runs if, the runs the studio in here. If you come by the house, we'll I'll I'll give you I'll take you through the tasting. All right. All right. Cheers. Cheers.